This video is sponsored by Squarespace. In the space of just a few years, design went from looking like this to this. Now, just looking at the portraits of these designers says a lot about how they want you to view them. Richard Sapper is the designer who made this chair in 1979, and this is the team that designed the crazy furniture from 1981. The 1980s was a creative explosion of weird, impulsive, and fun design. This was enabled by new innovations in technology and mindsets around collaboration and teamwork. This particular design movement called Memphis was famously described as a shotgun wedding between Bauhaus and Fisher Price. This is the kind of design work that defined the 80s, but there's a lot more to these designs than just how crazy they look. When I started doing research for this video, I realized that a lot of things happening in the 1980s are happening again now. So for example, this gaming console from the 80s looks completely different from the one designed in 2020 to the right over here. But in terms of the philosophy behind the design, they have a lot more in common with each other than you might think. I think that the mindset of the 80s is actually starting to resonate with people on a deeper level, which we'll explore more throughout the video. First, let me give you some context. The idealized, prosperous, martini-sipping world of the 1950s was shattered in the 60s and 70s. There was a civil rights movement, a looming Russian threat, political scandals. Well, I'm not a crook. High inflation and surging gas prices. Now, if this sounds similar to the present day, that's because it is. When the 80s rolled around, it's not that these threats disappeared. It's just that a lot of people accepted them and moved forward in a more optimistic way. Design is informed by the cultural ideas of the time. So the fact that there are so many similarities between the events leading up to the design trends in the 80s and now is really important to consider. I wasn't practicing as a designer until 2010, so I want to talk to a friend of mine who actually lived and worked through the 1980s, designing for companies like Toyota, Subaru, and Mattel. He's also really good at whistling. Well, sorry about that. I also sat down with Mara Holt Scove, a design historian who personally knows a few of the designers from the Memphis movement. The first thing about 80s design that I think is most important in terms of its impact is that it, it took the seriousness out of design. <laughs> design was a very serious profession. It, it had a magazine called Industrial Design, and it was very formal, and articles were very scholarly. And, and while there was a lot of fun stuff happening, you had to work within the corporate context. So the 80s kind of broke that open, but it was fun. It allowed people to break away uh, without losing some of that corporate context. Now, there's nothing more pretentious than a designer's professional portrait. Like, why do we always touch our face? Like, what are we staring at with such intensity, like in this middle distance sort of area? We all do it, including me. It's like a sickness or something. The 1980s basically smashed this paradigm of scholarly, self-important designers. One of the best examples of this was the Memphis design movement, which really defined the culture and look of the 1980s. Good taste, was the bad thing that they were fighting against. They were making designs that intentionally broke every design rule in the book. Now, a lot of this fresh, fun perspective was enabled by two main factors. The first factor was a new perspective on what a product could be and how to express certain abstract ideas through what a product looks like. It wasn't just form follows function anymore. It was also form follows meaning and form follows emotion. The second factor was a renewed emphasis on collaboration and teamwork. This was enabled by new technology, but it was also a direct result of the exploration of Form Follows Emotion. It's important to note that the Memphis Design Group was a collective of several international designers. Rafi explains more about the collaborative attitude in the 80s here. I think the team effort sort of grew out of the understanding that our products were useful and functional, but they weren't emotional. I can be emotional as an individual, but it's going to be my own personal feel. So if I'm going to impart emotion into my product, I kind of have to get to understand how other people feel about it while it's under development. So I think that that movement from function to emotion had to have more of a communal effect. And we did see evidence of that in the 60s, but it really didn't materialize in an industrial way until people started seeing the benefits of merging multiple disciplines. And one of the biggest companies that was supportive of that was frog design. Form follows emotion was originally a phrase coined by Hartmut Esslinger. 
He's most famous for designing the first Apple products in the 1980s. In the spirit of collaborative team efforts, Esslinger changed the name of his studio from Esslinger Design to Frog Design to show that it was a democratic place of work where ideas are openly and freely shared among a team. So it wasn't just about him anymore. He also made the letters in Frog Design all lowercase for pretty much the same reason. Working together as a designer was far better than being an individual icon of design. The idea of the celebrated Raymond Lowy or Charles Eames or, you know, these individualized people were no longer needed. What was needed was that the product itself needed to be the hero. With the product as the hero, there was an emphasis on more expressive designs. Rather than having the product blend seamlessly into an experience, the product needed to stand out and say something. But the shift towards more team-based design wasn't the only thing that drove this new form follows emotion idea. Designers weren't as constrained by internal components, so they had a lot more flexibility around what the shape of the object could be. Just look at the internal components of this rotary telephone. It's got solenoids, it's got bells, it's got giant rotary mechanical components, and each of these components needs to be placed in a very specific area, and they're a very specific shape. So those components kind of drive the shape of the outer device. And a lot of the time, these components were kind of heavy, so balance and comfort and ergonomics were more important than ever. But by the time the 1980s rolled around, many of these mechanical components were just replaced with a printed circuit board, also known as PCBs. PCBs do have constraints, don't get me wrong, but not as many as older mechanical assemblies. One of the most famous examples that Rafi actually sent me was this answering machine designed by Frog Design. Without the need for tape gears and motors, the team just kind of created this crazy architectural form that didn't really relate to anything other than expressing an abstract idea around Zen gardens or something. I don't even know, really. Rafi was telling me that this thing was really hard to use and it apparently sold horribly. It was a nice reminder to designers that you still need to create a functional object in addition to it being emotive. It's both, not either or. Now, to be fair to the team at Frog, it was probably challenging to strike that balance, right? If a product is not as constrained by its components, how do you make customers understand what it is or how to use it? Some people took it very literally, like in this example. Others were a lot more artistic with it. And I mean, sure, designers did this all the time before the 1980s, but it was never as prevalent and usually not as concentrated or as popular. Esslinger is having to find the form for this new technology. What does that form look like? You know, certainly it doesn't look like Memphis, not until the 90s. Do computer designers feel like, oh, we can get a little wacky, you know, and bring color in and little squiggly patterns and things. They don't feel safe enough to do that until then. Esslinger is sort of, he's taking his form follows emotion and recognizing that we need to create objects that we want to live with, we want to care about, if we're going to allow them into our daily lives. I want to talk about Squarespace. Now, I personally have used Squarespace for my own portfolio site for over a decade. It's got a ton of features that make it easy for everyone to make a website quickly. So if you're making a portfolio site and you want to make something fast, they have some absolutely beautiful layouts that will make your work shine. Their website builder is the best in the business, so you can customize templates with simple drag and drop controls. And if you want to go deeper, you can customize your site fully with CSS. There's a reason why I've been using Squarespace for so long, and there's a reason why I'm talking about them right now. It's easy to use and fully customizable. Head to squarespace.com slash design theory to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using code design theory. Back to the video. With the lack of constraints around form and function, designers could make the design any shape they wanted. I found a lot of these examples from Matthew Bird. He's a design history professor at RISD, and I've posted the link to his channel in the description. One example he mentions is this design. This is the PCB from the device. The designers had to make a housing for this thing, but there were no ergonomic constraints, and there were pretty much no functional constraints at all, other than housing the electronics. But the designers still had to decide, like, okay, what should the design look like? So rather than just housing the box in an ordinary rectangular enclosure, they gave it this sort of multi-layered feel and accentuated the idea of two geometric forms intersecting each other by giving each piece a distinctly different pattern. The area where the power goes into the device is a great example of form follows emotion. 
because the wavy line sort of express the fact that the device is being injected with electricity right here. In case you're wondering what this thing even is, that's understandable. It's an interactive choose your own adventure gaming console that's plugged into a television. I think this is really important to point out because the Viewmaster sort of paved the way for other expressive designs like the PlayStation 5 console. Obviously the PS5 is a complete completely different looking design, but the idea of creating an expressive form that was not so rigidly defined by its function is very similar to the Viewmaster. The PS5 doesn't need to be this shape, it could have been a simple rigid box like the Xbox Series S, but by having a more expressive design, it gives us an expectation around what it might emotionally feel like to use the device. The PS5 looks like an alien piece of technology that's going to transport you to an alien world while playing it. Even if we look at the seemingly utilitarian boxy designs that Esslinger and his team did for Apple, there were still some emotional considerations. So for example, Esslinger says that the original Apple Macintosh design was inspired by the Navajo sand paintings and Aztec stone relief sculptures that he saw. Since Apple was an American company, he wanted the inspiration to come from Native American tribes rather than any sort of European influence or anywhere else. He said that the sand paintings were especially interesting to him because the silicon chips that went into Apple's products were made from the same sand. Now, I have no idea if this is the real inspiration, but that's what Esslinger claims. Whether or not that's the truth is really kind of irrelevant. What's important is that it makes the objects more interesting. And it's a great example of the power of adding a layer of context or story to your product. These sorts of storytelling devices are used in product design and marketing now more than ever. Now, I know that the original Macintosh looks really tame by today's standards, but you have to remember what other computers before it looked like. They were incredibly mechanical and technical looking. Now, most of the examples I've shown so far have primarily been appearance or sort of surface level design changes, but the 1980s marked one of the first times where designers consistently transcended surface level changes. Because they used to call designers stylists. And during that period, designers were moving away from being stylists and now becoming more involved in sort of a team approach to design. The way that the Frog Design and the Apple team created some products that define the next 40 years is pretty special. We take it for granted now, but here's what Rafi said design used to be like prior to the 1980s. They followed style rather than working in a team with engineers and starting at the beginning. Automobile designers, for example, were handed the wheelbase and the overall dimensions, the package, so to speak, and they were told to style the bodies. Same thing with uh, designers for contemporary appliances. They designed the exterior. They worked with the finishes, the colors. They were styling studios. Very, very different. They were not uh, sort of merged with cultural trends or political ideas as much as we would see in the late 70s and into the 80s. And of course now, we see a tremendous amount of convergence with media, cultural events, and design. Now, the spirit of collaboration started in the 1980s, but it didn't really blossom until the 1990s with consultancies like IDEO. I'm gonna do a whole separate video on the 90s, so be sure to subscribe when it drops. But back to the 80s. Teamwork was also enabled by technology. Early versions of email became available by the mid 1980s and ideas and files could be shared across continents. So rather than physically transporting papers and physical models, you could just share the files with each other on a small disk. And yes, Zoomers, believe it or not, the save icon is actually based on a physical object called a floppy disk. I've shown floppy disks to my students before and they thought it was a 3D printed save icon. It's true. I see a similar forward progression happening more in the present day as a direct result of the events that happened from March, 2020 onward. With everyone stuck inside, we were forced to adapt to remote communication. Now, I think that Zoom meetings are horrible and boring, but they did help us to collaborate more freely across the world. There are other platforms like Slack and Discord that allow designers to share their ideas with each other in real time. Ideas are being shared more and more rapidly through these modern platforms. On the Design Theory Discord, we have meaningful discussions over voice chat. Okay, there's a lot of shit posting and insanity, but you can learn a lot there. <laughs> the openness to new ideas in the 80s was also a result of subcultures like punk music and hip hop culture making it on music television, also known as MTV. MTV brought many underground musical artists into the mainstream consciousness. Exposure to new ideas like this simply makes us more open to them. The same thing is happening today, but on a more niche scale. You can pretty much 
always find some group of weirdos online who share some kind of interest, whether it's on Reddit, Discord, or YouTube. If we go back to the Memphis design movement, it was basically a reaction against the overly cold, overly pretentious, and overly functional designs of the entire 20th century. What is Memphis? Well, it's the opposite of what the project of modernism had been. We know how to make a chair. We know how to make a table. We know how to make 100,000 of the same. And so it's really boring to make a new chair unless that chair is representing a philosophy because the job of that work is to ask questions and push back. It was started by a well-known designer named Ettore Sotsas. He never really wanted to identify as the leader of it because it went against the team spirit that he felt was so important to the collaboration. And for anyone wondering, the name Memphis was intentionally a little bit ambiguous. Supposedly the song Stuck Inside a Mobile with the Memphis Blues Again by Bob Dylan was playing in the studio when the designers all sort of met up for the first time. So they impulsively decided to just call the movement that, which is kind of funny. But it kind of works on a deeper level because you're not sure if they're talking about Memphis, Tennessee or the ancient city of Memphis in Egypt. And it was truly an international design movement. And that was reflected in the vagueness of the name. Another important thing to keep in mind is the way that 3D CAD and CNC prototyping started to take hold in the mid 80s. So rather than sculpting models by hand, you can make a 3D model in the computer and have a machine make it for you. Now to this day, hand sculpting is still a lot faster in some cases, and the 1980s 3D CAD programs were very, very primitive. But in certain sectors, especially towards the second half of the decade, the technology enabled us to iterate much faster. Rapid iterations that are enabled by new technology are starting to happen again with artificial intelligence in design. Once again, I'm gonna do a whole separate video on this too, so be sure to subscribe when it drops. Click that damn red button. Click the red button. Click the red button, click it. The only point that I wanna make here is that AI is going to cause a similar rapid increase in iterations, kind of like how 3D modeling and CAD did in the 80s. Really, the main thing that you need to keep in mind about the similarities between the 80s and the 2020s is that they were both preceded by chaotic times. They ushered in a new era of collaboration and the new tools enabled expressive, crazy, and fun designs. Now, it's impossible to predict the future. While the conditions that led to the fun, creative explosion are present today, there's no telling what the future holds or how we will adapt to those changes this time around. I think it might be good to end the video with this quote from an article by Michael McDonough and Stephen Scove Holt though. Memphis wasn't really about the end artifact. Underneath the weird shapes and funny patterns was the importance of conviction, the conviction to break new ground and explore something different. Steven and Michael were talking about Memphis design here, but I think it also applies to other designers of the 80s as well. One of the most famous 1980s designers to really embrace this ideal is Luigi Colon. He came up with some absolutely wild concepts that showed real fearlessness. In reading this quote, I can't help but think of Kanye West and his team's modern approach to design of the Yeezy shoes. I hope we hold on to that exploratory mindset in the future. Whatever happens next, I'm sure it's gonna be interesting. There are just too many crazy things converging all at once for there not to be a creative explosion of some kind. But really the most important thing is where are we going? The answers we have to come up with are really different answers than from the 20th century and even from the early 21st century because now we have more alternatives and the stakes you know, the stakes were always high, you know, but now we're really, really seeing the impacts of those stakes. Thanks for checking out the video, everyone. If you enjoyed it, consider subscribing by clicking the red subscribe button below. If you really enjoyed the video, you might also consider checking out my Patreon. There's a whole bunch of cool bonuses on there. But anyway, have a great day.